given 6 nodes in a string i0 to i5 okay, and let us say each node has data for its next neighbor, okay, wants to send some data to its next neighbor and suppose RTS, CTS and ACK takes 1 unit of time each, okay, data and ACK okay, or let us say data takes 5 units of time, let us just change the numbers. Okay. So, we have to figure out when does the transfer complete? When does when do all the nodes finish communicating to each other? Okay. So basically, if you see one one transmission, one frame exchange sequence, right? So we always deal in terms of this frame exchange sequence in 802.11, right? So one frame exchange sequence is what RTS plus CTS plus data plus ACK, right? So that's equal to 1 plus uh, 8 units of time. So one frame exchange sequence is going to take 8 units of time, right? How many can go in parallel? So let us look at <coughs> how many can go in parallel, round 1. Let us say in the first round, which suppose I0 is transmitting, I0 to I1 transmission is going on. Is there anything that can go in parallel with it? I1 to I2, I4 is not transmitting to I3, IN is sending to IN plus 1. Okay. So can I2 transmit to I3? <coughs> Suppose I2 is transmitting to I3, okay. I0 is transmitting to I1, what will happen? Where will be the collision? Suppose I0 and I2 are both transmitting simultaneously. Okay. There will be a collision at I1, right? So that is why I2 cannot transmit at the same time as I0, even though it is transmitting in the other direction, right? <coughs> How about I3? Can I3 transmit to I4? Right. So the first round, what you have is I0 goes to I1 and I3 can transmit to I4, right? So that is 8 units. So, there are two parallel transmissions. What happens in the next one? Next one you have I1 transmitting to I2 and I4 to I5. Okay. And in the third round, you can have who is transmitting? I2, I2 to I3. So, you have 24 units of time as the <coughs> uh, minimum amount of time in which this data transfer can uh, complete. Okay. So, all right. So, now going on with this same example that we had. Okay. So, the key thing that we were talking about is priorities, right? So, how do we set up priorities? Now, the important thing here is that there are three different types of interframe spacings, right? So initially, before you start transmitting, so let me first bring up the slide and then we will try to understand why this is so. Okay. So if you see that between RTS and CTS, okay, <coughs> do I need any gap? So I am sending you an RTS, you have to send me back a CTS, right? Is there any time interval that will come at that point? Timeout, it is not a timeout <laughs> due to switching, right? See, always remember we are trying to keep the cost down. So, we do not have separate receivers and transmitters. So, you have to finish receiving the RTS and then you have to switch to transmitting the CTS. So, there is going to be a receiver transmitter turnaround time, correct? What other delays? Okay, let us try to work this out again in a little bit more de detail, okay? So, <coughs> RTS, CTS delays involved. Okay. So, one is, so let us say construction of RTS. Okay. It will take some time to construct the RTS packet. Okay. So, this typically we will say ignore because you start counting after the RTS packet is constructed. Then second is transmission of RTS. Then 
this is saying from the network card on to medium right. So, you have created the RTS packet now you have to transmit the RTS packet on to the medium. So, there is a delay involved in being able to put the transmission uh, put the RTS packet from the network card on to the medium right. This is typically what is called your transmission delay right after that propagation delay right right. So, there is a delay involved in propagation of RTS to receiver after that receive reception of RTS ok reception of RTS ok. So, again from medium from phi to from the phi to the MAC right I have to receive the RTS at the receiver correct then ok receiver transmitter turn around then construction of CTS right construction of CTS or what is called the MAC processing delay okay, this is the MAC processing delay you have to construct the CTS packet that is your MAC processing delay. So, at least there are these many delays involved in an RTS CTS exchange ok. So, it is not instantaneous correct. So, this is called your short interframe spacing right. So, basically what this means is after you send the RTS packet there is a certain delay before which you cannot receive the CTS packet ok. So, this is typically of the order of uh, 10 microseconds. So, similarly you can calculate other types of delays in your network. So, these are the different types of uh, short interframe spacing it is the highest priority for acknowledgement CTS polling response and so on ok. <coughs> so, this is generally called as 10 microseconds there is also a notion of a slot time we will just come to that in a moment ok. So, let us just see how this looks ok. So, when we are doing RTS CTS you have the sender waiting for a DIFS amount of time ok. There is an RTS packet that goes on the network there is a SIFS amount of time what is this SIFS amount of time all these delays that we just tried to measure then it sends the CTS then again there is an SIFS amount of time and then the data again there is an SIFS amount of time and then the acknowledgement correct. So, this entire thing is your frame exchange sequence ok. So, what is this NAV? NAV basically stands for network allocation vector. So, as soon as I hear the RTS the other station is going to set that the network is going to be busy for so much duration of time. The RTS packet comes along with this information of how much data is to be transmitted. So, that is when it is going to set the NAV that is just a jargon that is being used ok. <coughs> is that making sense how the RTS CTS works ok. So, now now we understand why this DIFS has to be greater than SIFS time right. If the DIFS time is equal to the SIFS time or less see because nobody asked me the question why 50 microseconds right. So, this class we have been asking a lot of why's right. I said DIFS time is 50 microseconds nobody asked me why 50 microseconds. Why is it 50 microseconds ok so that is a good question right. How did I come up with 10 microseconds as the SIFS time? So, it depends upon what does it depend upon this can be fixed right this can be fixed, but this will depend upon rate no, distance and also rate right it will also depend upon rate. So, are you doing 11 Mbps are you doing 54 Mbps right what is the type of uh, phi that you are using here that is what it will take right. So, that is all these things are going to depend upon the rate of the phi. So, depending upon the type of the phi that you are using for direct sequence spread spectrum <coughs> ok and 11 Mbps phi you have 10 microseconds. So, this is for. So, if you are going to use frequency hopping spread spectrum and uh, frequency hopping is actually also 11 Mbps or if you are using OFDM and 54 uh, Mbps then the slot the IFS, SIFS time will be different ok. What are the various timings that are involved ok. 
So, we have seen that SIFS time is 10 microseconds, okay. DIFS time has to be more than 10 microseconds. <coughs> so, if you see here, we have defined DFS time as SIFS time plus 2 times the slot time. Okay. What is the slot time? Slot time is, is just a notional convenience, okay. So, there is no notion of real slots in A22.11. Just for convenience, we are defining it as slot time, okay. So, <coughs> SIFS time is basically 10 microseconds, slot time is, <coughs> sorry, slot time is 20 microseconds, okay. So, ideally we could have kept DIFS time as SIFS plus 1 slot time, okay, is not it? Why is the slot time defined as 20 microseconds? That is just convenience, right, that is what I said. Just for convenience, we are defining slot time as 20 microseconds. So, given that SIFS is 10 and slot time is 20 microseconds, okay, <coughs> what we do is we cannot have DIFS just as SIFS plus 1 slot time because suppose there is an access point in the medium, right. Suppose I have an access point, suppose you and I are talking, but there is an access point in the area which is going to also control the medium. So, the access point should have priority over any two random people talking. Right? Like let us say you are at an airport, okay, so you have a laptop, your friend has a laptop and there is an access point also which is installed at the airport, right. So now the access point should get priority over communication in that medium rather than you and your friend, right. So that is the reason why you have what is called the PIFS time in between, okay. PIFS stands for PCF interframe spacing. So since you are going to wait for Okay, since you are going to wait for this much amount of time, okay, since you are going to wait for a DIFS amount of time, if the access point is going to wait for lesser amount of time, then it will be able to grab the medium before you do. So that is all, that is all it means, okay. So in order for this frame exchange sequence to complete, you are going to use the minimum amount of time, right, which is SIFS. After that, the access point is the next higher priority station. So, it will use half of this time and then will be any other free agent which can transmit here. So, PIFS time is SIFS time plus slot time, DIFS time is SIFS time plus 2 times the slot time, okay. So, that is all that is there to it, <coughs> okay. So, there is also a notion of fragmentation which we are not really going to go into, but basically this is again uh, a straightforward extension of this RTS CTS mechanism. Now the question is how long a packet can I transmit on a wireless medium, right. The longer packet I transmit, what happens? The less the, the less the overhead, correct. With one RTS CTS I can send a long packet, but the longer the packet the more the chances of error correct. So, depending upon what happens in the medium, sometimes what you can do is after the RTS CTS you can send one fragment, again use the same SIFS acknowledgement mechanism, send the other fragment and then again use the same SIFS and acknowledgement mechanism. So, this is called fragmentation in uh, 802.11, right. So, when you look at a card, okay. So, when you look at configuring a either an 802.11 access point or card, okay. So, you will you will see two, three numbers there. Okay. So, you will see three numbers there. One you will see something called the RTS threshold, okay. So, this is just a screen which you will get. How many of you have seen this? Okay. If you have a laptop, you just try to configure its wireless interface, you will see all these numbers, you know. So, you will get a table which will say okay RTS threshold and you have to, you will have a drop down there where you will set some number there, okay. So, let us say 1200 bytes, right. Then similarly there will be something called a fragmentation threshold, okay. That will be something like 2400 bytes. There will be power, transmit power. So, if it is an access point you will say okay 100, uh, 1 watt or 100 milliwatts you will see channels. So, 802.11 has how many channels? 
11 channels. Okay. So, you will see channels 1, 2, 11 and you have to pick the channel on which you are operating. So, th there will be a bunch of such configuration parameters that you will see when you are trying to configure either your access point or your card. <coughs> okay. So, on the access point you will pick, so generally out of these you have channels 1, 6 and 11 are non-interfering, non-overlapping. Okay. <coughs> so, what does that mean? That basically means you can have three operators operating in the same area, in the same airport you can have three different operators operating without having to worry about any interference caused from one to the other because they are on non-overlapping channels, completely non-overlapping. So, for this, this basically you have taken 83 megahertz of the spectrum, right. So, out of the 83 megahertz spectrum, you have said this is channel 1 and then this is channel 2 and then this is channel 3 and so on, okay. So, that is the way you are dividing up the channels. So, channel 1 and channel 6 are totally non-overlapping, okay. <coughs> channel 6 and channel 11 are also totally non-overlapping. Is that making sense? What we are saying? Okay. So, this is the idea of fragmentation. Okay. Let us do a small example at this point. Is the fragmentation used to do some kind of reduction in the interference? So, not exactly. So, what fragmentation is used to used for is you set a threshold and you say that if I am going to send such a large packet, see the <coughs> then I am going to break up the packet into smaller chunks. So, that I can utilize you know in case one part of it does not uh, get through, then only that part needs to be retransmitted. So, that is the key idea. Instead of sending one large packet, you are going to send smaller packets. So, that your retransmission effort becomes less. So, that is the key reason for doing the trans. Will it improve the? Okay, so you tell me. Will it improve the efficiency? No, there is no, it is not a clear answer. So, there is a depends clause to it. So, it will improve the efficiency under what circumstances? If then, if there are, the medium is loss. Okay, if the medium is error prone, then if I do not use fragmentation, I will wind up sending larger packets which will get lost, which will have to be retransmitted, right. So, at that point when I am using fragmentation, then it may happen that some of my fragments will get through and only smaller fragments may have to be retransmitted, correct. So, in a lossy medium, it is likely to improve the efficiency. On the other hand, if my medium is loss free, then it will reduce it because I have this overhead of you know each fragment is going to be associated with an SIFS, an ACK, you know another SIFS, another fragment, another ACK. So, that is the overhead which is associated with the, okay. So, there is something called an EIFS, there is also something called an AIFS, okay. Now, we are not going to go into those things here, okay. They come in for the uh, 802.11e kind of uh, technique, we are not going into too much detail about those uh, interframe spacings. Okay. Let us do an example here. Okay. <coughs> so, suppose we have three stations. Okay. Let us just to understand, just to make sure that we understood. Okay. So, you have S1, S2 and S3. Okay. <coughs> now, S1 has a packet to transmit at t equal to 0, okay. packet of size 500 bytes. Okay. S2 gets a packet at t plus 120 microseconds of size 1400 bytes and S3 has a packet of size t plus 250 microseconds, packet of size again 500. Okay. So, we have three stations. Does it matter to whom they are transmitting? Suppose I were to say S1 is transmitting to S3, 
S2 is transmitting to S1 and so on. Does it matter? Does the destination matter? So, this is again a question out of one of my exams. Okay. So, in, the, in that I have a lot of this extraneous detail saying that S1 is sending to S2, S2 is sending to S3 and so on. Does it matter? That is irrelevant because it is a LAN, right? So, we are saying it is a LAN. So, it really does not matter who the destination is, it only matters who is going to get a chance to speak, right. <coughs> so, S1 actually S1 is transmitting to S3, S2 is transmitting to S1, S3 is transmitting to S2, okay. <coughs> that does not matter. Okay, now, given that given that slot time, what was slot time? Slot time is 20 microseconds. SIFS time? SIFS time was 10 microseconds, right? Given slot time is 20 microseconds, SIFS time is 10 microseconds, right? Let us say we have uh, RTS CTS act size as 100 bytes, okay? <coughs> and then we have RTS threshold as 1200 bytes. and let us say fragmentation threshold as 2400 bytes. Okay. And now, suppose we say 200 bytes per slot time. Okay. You can transfer 200 bytes in each slot time, just, just to make the thing easy. Okay. So, when is the data transfer going to complete? Okay, <coughs> let us not worry about the exact number, let us try to see how to go about doing this. So, what happens to S1? Send RTA first, send RTS, is that right? No, first DIFS, first is DIFS, then, then I send RTS, is it? See the packet size, see that is why it is important to know what is the packet size. Packet size is 500 bytes. My RTS threshold is 1200 bytes. Okay. So, for any packet which is smaller than 1200 bytes, I am not going to send any RTS CTS. So, this is DIFS plus data plus ACK. Is that correct? Hmm? DIFS plus data plus ACK? Yeah. So, there has to be an SIFS. DIFS plus data plus SIFS plus ACK. Right? So, this DIFS is now SIFS plus 2 slot time 50 microseconds, data is 500 bytes which is going to take uh, 200 bytes per 20 microseconds. So, this is again another 50 microseconds, right? This will take another 50 microseconds plus this will take 10 microseconds plus this will take 10 microseconds, right? So, 120 microseconds. S1's data transfer completes in 120 microseconds, right? Agreed? Okay. What happens to S2? <coughs> S2 waits for DIFS, then plus RTS plus CTS, SIFS plus CTS plus SIFS plus data plus SIFS plus ACK, right? That is what happens for S2, correct? How much does this work out to? Okay, so this is 50 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. What is the data? 1400 bytes, right? So, this is 140 plus 10 plus 10, correct? That is, how much is this? 250, this is 250 microseconds. This data transfer takes 250 microseconds on your air, okay? So, now what happens to S3? S3 starts with DIFS. See, look at what has happened. At t equal to 0, S1's packet came, 120 microseconds were taken by t equal to 0. At t equal to 
120 plus 250 is when the medium has become free. Okay. The S3's packet has come at T plus 250. So what happened when S3's packet arrived? It found that the medium was busy. So what should it be doing? It has to do a back off before it does the DIFS, right? So it has to do back off, right? So even if you assume that it is going to back off for one slot, right? So <coughs> you will have it going for 20 plus this DIFS data SIFS ACK which is 120, right? Is that making sense? I can't just say that S3 is the same as S1. Although the packet size is the same, okay, the data transfer duration is not the same because S1 did not have any back off involved, S3 has a back off involved. Okay. So S3 is going to have back off plus all this DIFS business. So that will be 20 plus the 120 microseconds which we know that this exchange takes 120 microseconds, correct? <coughs> Okay. So now you can calculate that this is again another 140 microseconds. So you add up all these three numbers uh, which is what 260, 510, right? Which is 510 microseconds is when the entire data transfer is going to complete. Does that make sense? Will S2 have a back off time? No, because just when its packet arrives it finds that the medium is free. Because S1's uh, transfer, data transfer took 120, huh? after the ACK there is no SIFS after an ACK. Once S1's data transfer is complete, at the same instant of time S2's packet arrived, S2 started sensing the medium, right? So it finds that the medium is free, so it does not back off, right? If S2's packet were to arrive at T plus 119 then it will back off, okay? Because it arrives at T plus 120 or let us make it easier, T plus 121, it is not going to back off, okay? But that is not true for S3 because its packet arrives in between S2's data transfer. So S3 has to do the back off, correct? Okay. How is the back off time calculated? Random, right? So when you ask the question what is the minimum amount of time in which the data transfer has to complete, you have to assume that you know one unit of back off is going to be performed, okay. Yeah, S3 follows the routine saying that I am going to come, so see the same thing that happens in the previous slide that is what is happening here. So S3 is like this station here, it got data when it found that the medium was busy. So when it found that the medium was busy, it just picks a back off number. So this is the station 2 that we are showing here is it corresponds to S3 in our example, correct? So this one is going to wait, it is going to find that you know somebody else is transmitting, it is going to pick a back off number here, then it will wait for this DFS amount of time, it will wait for its back off to finish and only then it can transmit, correct? So this is the case which we have to compute. So now all that we are saying is that this back off is a is the minimum that we are picking because we want to know what is the earliest time the data transfer can complete. So while I am counting down, if I find that the medium becomes busy, then I have to again stop and go through the process again. See that is the case that is happening with S1 in this example, okay. See what happened to S1? S1 is counting down, okay. While it is counting down, it finds that this guy has already tra started transmitting, so it has to freeze its back off counter and then Again it has to wait for DIFS and then again it has to do the counting down, okay. It is not after back off. If during back off, so I find that somebody else has occupied the medium, then I have to wait. See it is always like this, the previous uh, slide shows that, no? See it is always like this. DIFS, if the medium is busy, then you back off, otherwise you wait for a DIFS, count your slots, if the medium continues to be free, you just transmit. Okay, there are no two times DIFS involved. Does that make sense? <coughs> I wait for a DIFS amount of time, I do the back off counting. If for this entire duration I find the medium is free, I transmit, that is all, okay. If for the DIFS amount of time I find that if I am the first to arrive, 
then my back off value is 0, that is all. You always wait for DIFS plus back off. Okay? Sometimes the back off value may be 0 if you are the first guy to arrive. Other times you may have a non zero value for the back off. Okay? <coughs> so, let us continue, let us look at one other mode of 802.11's function. So, this is what is called the DCF mode of functioning. Okay? So, DCF means distributed coordination function. So, everybody waits for DIFS amount of time and goes ahead. The other mode called the PCF is much easier to understand, but unfortunately it has not been implemented by any vendor. Okay? So, all the vendors use DCF only. Nobody has implemented this PCF mode. The PCF mode is basically saying that there is an access point. So, think of it like this. You know, I can be considered as the access point and all of you can be considered as the nodes. Okay? So, I basically poll every node saying that do you have any data to transmit, do you have any data to transmit, do you have any data to transmit. That is as simple as that, the PCF mode of operation. Okay? So, if you look at the slide, you find that PCF mode you wait for a PIFS amount of time. right? Why is this PIFS and not DIFS? Because I have to get priority. Since I am the access point, I have to get priority over somebody else who is waiting to transmit in the distributed mode. So, it waits for SIFS plus 1 slot time, transmit downlink data 1, SIFS and then this guy will transmit the uplink data, SIFS it will transmit the downlink data, this guy will transmit the uplink data. So, that is the way it goes. So, I will send you data and then you can send me back data in the same frame, okay, pretty much uh, sorry in the same frame exchange sequence. So, pretty much the same action that takes place. Is there a need for RTS CTS here? No, there is no need for an RTS CTS, right? Is there a need for acknowledgement? Yes, okay, there is always a need for acknowledgement in an unreliable medium, okay? How do I do acknowledgements? See, for example, in this, we have not put in any acknowledgements, right? How do I do acknowledgements? I will piggyback it, right? So, on this data, I will put an acknowledgement which will acknowledge this and then this will be data for the next station. Okay. So, there is a lot of detail here, but we do not need to go into it because uh, PCF is not really implemented and if you look at 802.11e, the newer generation of access points which are 802.11e, this PCF has got transformed into something called HCF, you know, hybrid coordination function. So, that is why we will not do too much detail of PCF. <coughs> So, at the end of the PCF, the access point will send something called the basically to signify that the PCF mode has ended, it will send a packet which will signify that, you know, it is called the CF end. Okay. <coughs> the only way in which you can tell me that to add your name into the polling cycle is using the DCF mode, right. So, that is why it is always that even in the PCF mode, okay, so even if you are doing PCF mode, it works like this. So, you will wait for a PIFS amount of time, okay. you will go for what is called the contention free period. Okay. So, this is the polling, okay. then it will go for a contention period, this is your DCF mechanism, okay, RTS CTS mechanism okay. and this cycle will repeat. After this again it will go for PIFS and so on. Okay. <coughs> so, even in the PCF mode you find that there is a, it is not just contention free. Towards the end of it you always have some contention period. So, this is for new stations to join. Right? and for other conversations. Now, for example, if it is an airport, you do not want the access point to control the medium all the time, so that two other people who are not belonging to the access point network can never get to speak. Right? So, that is why non PCF traffic. In polling, is there any priority which can be set? Uh, well, theoretically yes. 
Practically, since nobody has implemented PCF, it doesn't matter. Okay. Theoretically, yes, because the access point is the one which decides the schedule. How do I set the priority? I set the priority by giving you a chance twice and giving that person a chance only once. Right? So, the access point can easily do that. It can easily implement priority by saying that I will poll this station twice as often as I poll the other station. Each time you are polled, you can transmit one packet. So, that is the way in which it could be set if there is a schedule in the access point. So, as such in the standard there is nothing mentioned, the standard does not say that this should be the, no it should be round robin or it should be anything, it just says that some scheduling algorithm should be implemented at the PCF for deciding the polling schedule. Okay, so, given that let us see how this gateway business works. So, let us say, so what we are now trying to understand, this is probably the one of the last points that we need to understand. So, let us say you have a network like this, okay, you have access point 1 you have access point 2 okay, and you have STA 1 and you have STA 2. Okay. <coughs> so, now STA 1 wants to send a packet to STA 2. Okay. What are the different segments of the communication? That is what we need to figure out. Send a packet to STA 2. Okay. How does that happen? So, the question is how many addresses do I need in my frame? Four addresses I need, which four since we are showing four entities, we need four addresses. right? So, what is the first hop of my journey? STA 1 to AP 1 correct. Second hop is A p 1 to A p 2, third hop is A p 2 to S t a 2, right. <coughs> now, given that this is how our four addresses should look like. Okay. So, we know that we need four addresses in our system address 1, address 2, address 3, address 4. Okay. Can you try to figure out what will go into each of these addresses in each of these cases? Okay. So, we have three cases. Now, this is very dry. If I were to just describe this, it will be very boring. Okay. So, better to try to work it out. Okay. Look at these three cases. What will be the four addresses that go in here? So, what does it say? The first address is the destination address. Okay. So, address 1 will be STA 2, is that right? STA 2, address 1 is the, the next one is the source address, the STA 1 okay. and the third address is to the AP. There is no fourth address here. Okay. So, in the first case, what you are basically telling the AP, so you can think of this as the destination is different from the receiver. Okay. The source is different from the transmitter. So, try to keep a distinction between what is the source and what is the transmitter and what is the destination and what is the receiver in your mind. Okay. Then you will be able to figure this out very quickly. Okay. What is the source? in the first step STA 1, right. What is the transmitter in the first step? STA 1, right. So, the source and the transmitter are the same. Okay. What is the destination in the first step? STA 2, right. What is the receiver in the first step? AP 1, okay. So, that is why you have these three addresses working out like this. Okay. <coughs> Similarly, if you go to the third step, what is the destination? STA 2, right. What is the, the source? STA 1, okay. What is the transmitter? AP 2, right. So, the second case is the one where you have all the four addresses that are required. When this access point is sending it to this access point, right. So, what happens here? Transmitter is access point 1, 
right receiver is access point 2 but the source is sta1 and the destination is sta2 right is that making sense that's why you need four addresses so always try to determine when you are trying to do a, an example of this kind try to keep the distinction of source versus transmitter and destination versus receiver in your mind then it can't go wrong okay so you may actually the only place you could go wrong is fill in the wrong entry in the wrong column that's okay but all right so this is sta2 this is sta1 this is ap1 this is ap2 okay so now you can again use this as an example for setting lots of questions right you can give a different scenario suppose i put sta2 here then what will happen suppose i have to go to the internet then what will be the addresses so that's a good way of you know giving examples on this basis okay so so like i said you may have put the wrong entry in the wrong column the correct column is defined as far as this table is concerned what you need to understand is what are the entries okay it doesn't matter which entry you put in which column for that you can always look up this information now this guy will tell you that the bss id which is the access points id should go here right and then this is the source address this is the destination address so i just put it so that it looks uniform so that it looks as destination source receiver transmitter okay but that's not the order in which the uh, packet addresses need to be constructed hmm? okay so there is a reason for why this is so but that's not important is this format specific to 802.11 yes no this is not the ethernet format see in ethernet there is no notion of multi hopping okay so ethernet is single hop so what is the ethernet frame format <coughs> source address destination address finished okay significance of single hop is just one one connection so source is directly connected to the destination so when source is directly connected to the destination you call it single hop okay so when source has to go through an intermediate relay to the destination then it is called multi hop okay <coughs> all right so this is a kind of a summary of 802.11 not very important but the slide looks good that's why i put it there okay so it tells you you know what is dot 11a dot 11g you know what are the key differences and all that okay <clears throat> so let's do one exercise which i think is a bit important okay so what we did because that is where we have started this whole uh, design of the mac right so voice capacity in gsm okay this per cell we found was 125 into 8 right it's bounded by 125 into 8 which is less than 1000 users right <coughs> using using what 25 megahertz so let's do the same exercise for 802.11 okay and try to find out what it will have okay so we know that 802.11 uses 83 megahertz that so doesn't matter but we can say that it uses a 54 mbps radio okay this is the transmit rate phi rate okay let's say it's 54 mbps or it is 11 mbps okay you can use either of them it doesn't matter 11 mbps or 54 mbps so this 83 megahertz is not so significant right but we know that we are transmitting at 11 mbps or at 54 mbps okay <coughs> what do we expect as the answer okay so if you just see the numbers so using 25 megahertz and uh, okay and 9.6 kbps rate okay so using 25 megahertz and 9.6 kbps gsm is able to give you about 1000 users per cell right now using 83 megahertz and 54 mbps how much do you expect 
802.11 to give you more obviously right ok so that is why we need to do this calculation to understand why it is not obvious <coughs> try to do the calculation now ok let me give you a hint ok what you need to do is here there is a voice packet ok <coughs> so you will have let us say voice data this will become data there will be an RTP header ok. So, let us say this is voice data which is uh, 160 bytes 64 kbps ok. So, if you are using G711 codec, so it depends upon the codec that you are using. So, now if you are using G711 codec ok, so you it is going to sample it at 64 kbps G711 codec sampling. So, you are going to generate uh, this will work out to I think 160 bytes every 10 milliseconds ok. It is going to generate 160 bytes every 10 milliseconds ok. So, now what you will do is you will take this voice data it will, you will attach an RTP header ok. RTP is the protocol in which you have to carry voice right SIP all these guys have to attach a RTP header ok. Then what happens you attach a UDP header ok. Then you will attach a MAC header ok. <coughs> then you are going to attach a MAC header, then you attach a phi header ok. So, so many headers get attached to your 160 byte data packet alright and then you are going to transmit it onto the wireless medium to the access point ok. And then the access point has got to transmit it back to you ok. <coughs> so, just try to come up with some rough number. So, let us say you assume some numbers for this RTP header is 20 bytes, UDP header is 20 bytes you know MAC header you can take to be another uh, what is the MAC header in 802.11 let us let us just take 20 bytes as the numbers ok. Phi header is again now uh, in dot 11 the phi header is uh, I think close to 60 bytes or something ok. <coughs> so, if we just take these numbers what do you find all right let me do one thing <coughs> let me tell you the answer now, I do not have all the exact numbers here, but can you guess now that you have some idea of you know there are all these headers that are there can you guess in what range this number is going to fall. So, if you are just going to do plain calculation, if you just take the headers into account, you will find that this will be around 400 ok. But then there is one thing which we have missed out, which is not collisions, assuming no collisions ok. Assuming that there are no collisions, you still have SIFS plus data plus SIFS plus ACK that overhead ok. <coughs> so, if you take all the overheads into consideration the total number of voice calls that can be supported in such a system is 22 ok. <coughs> See that is the key difference so that is why I wanted to illustrate this okay. why it is so important to design the system keeping the final requirement in mind. This system is not designed for voice the system is designed for data system is designed for unlicensed spectrum, it is designed for low cost devices, it is designed for simple implementation ok. So, if on such a system you try to send a uh, voice traffic ok, the total voice under kind of good conditions what you can have is about 22 voice calls is what you will see in such a system. 
Whereas compare that with the GSM, you know, it is operating on much lesser spectrum, but it is able to cater to much larger number of users primarily because it is designed for that purpose. You know, there are no headers, just that one overhead has been taken off and already you get a huge gain, all right. So do one thing, you try to figure this out, you take some numbers for the RTP, UDP headers and all that. You already know the numbers for the SIFS data, already know the numbers for back off, right. <coughs> so remember that voice is now a two way communication, okay. So because of that you will find that it comes down to some number like this, okay. Also think of what is happening from the access points perspective, right. <coughs> So the access point is the one to whom everybody is trying to talk to, right. So even if these guys do not see any contention, at the access point there is always be, always going to be contention for transmitting, right. So the access point is contending uh, because it always has a queue of packets which it needs to send. Even though there may be four clients, each client has one packet, but the access point has four packets, one for each client, understand what I am saying. Okay. So that is why the access point, the back off keeps on getting more and more severe. Okay. So in reality you get a number something like around 20, 18 to 20 calls is what you can support in a 822.11 system, voice calls. Okay. Theoretically does the number of users supported by an access point change from 11 Mbps to 54 Mbps? Okay. Marginally it will change, but it is not significant because the significant overhead is in terms of your SIFS time your DIFS time, you always have to wait, right. So the access point has sent out one packet, what does it have to do? It has to back off. Even upon, see the one key difference between Ethernet and 802.11 is that even upon successful transmission, you have to back off. Why? If you are unsuccessful, you have to back off, that everybody can agree to. Why do you have to back off even if you are successful? give a chance to others, correct, because of that, right. If I am successful, I know exactly when my transmission ends and if I start counting DIFS from there, I know that I am going to be the guy who counts down first, right. So even if I am successful, I have to back off so that other people who are trying to transmit on the medium can get a chance to transmit. So think of what the access points life becomes, right. It has more packets to send and now after every packet it has to back off. Okay. So the system slows down, so access point becomes the bottleneck when we are doing voice over IP in a uh, Ethernet, uh, in a sorry, in a Wi-Fi medium, right. So voice over IP over Wi-Fi when you do, you have to keep in mind that the call handling capacity of the system is very small, okay. So once people discovered this, they went on to say that, okay, now how do we improve this, okay. <coughs> so how they improved that was? at the access point, so 802.11e came into being as a result of this, right. So at the access point they said that you know if I have multiple queues, okay, so let us say this is the priority. So at the access point, so priority is implemented different queues and different waiting times, okay. So I will just try to motivate how this thing came into being, okay. So this is let us say your voice queue, this is your FTP queue, okay. The access point is connected to one STA1 which is doing voice, okay. Another STA2 which is doing an FTP, right, okay. <coughs> so what we just saw was that the access point becomes the bottleneck because all the packets get queued at the access point, right. So now <coughs> if the voice flow and the FTP flow have to com compete with each other, then the life for the voice flow becomes even worse, right. What will happen? The delays will start increasing, right. The voice, what is the maximum delay tolerance in a voice system? It is about uh, 150 milliseconds end to end, right. So even if you are sitting at the other end of the world, you need the voice to be able to reach there within 150 milliseconds of leaving here, okay. So about 150 milliseconds of which you say that you know half of that delay is in the wireless part itself. 
So you say that I need to cross the wireless link in about 75 milliseconds, 75 to 80 milliseconds you need to be able to cross the wireless link, right. Where is the maximum delay? In the queuing, it is not the delay in propagation. So that is why 11 Mbps, 54 Mbps does not matter so much because that is not the delay. That is anyway happening at light speed, right. But <coughs> the queuing delay, the medium access delay, the DIFS takes 50 mi microseconds out of the whole thing, right. So that is where the main delays come into play. So once people observed this, they said, okay, let us try to separate these flows. So at the access point, so what 822.11e has is it has various flow categories, okay, what are called access categories, AC1, AC2, AC3, AC4, okay. So access categories basically means that I am going to classify a flow as a voice flow or as a video flow or as a FTP flow or as a HTTP flow, okay. Each of these are the four examples of the four categories, okay. Voice is highest priority and periodic, right. Voice is periodic, highest, pri uh, highest priority and periodic. Video is high priority but not periodic, right. It is not constant bit rate, it is variable bit rate. Then you have FTP which is a bursty data and then finally you have HTTP which is your best effort flow. You just say that okay, if I am able to get this through well and good, okay. <coughs> so those are the four access categories which this guy uses, okay, AC1 is voice, AC2 is video, AC3 is FTP. AC4 is HTTP, okay. So 822.11e creates four different queues and then it can do some kind of prioritizing. It can say that I am going to serve two packets from the AC1 queue every time before I serve a packet from the AC4 queue, okay. That is one way of doing prioritization. Another way of doing prioritization is that the back of values that I choose for the AC1 queue will be smaller than the back of values that I choose for the AC3 queue, correct. So these are the ways in which dot 11e tries to do prioritization, okay. How does it know that it is a voice packet because everything is IP because you are going to monitor the call setup, okay. You have to inform that this is a voice packet, okay. So I can actually infer by just looking at it. So there are two ways in order to understand. One is where you explicitly inform that this is being set up under this category, okay. So at the time of setting up a flow or at the time of, you know, connecting to Google, the card on your machine can inform the access point that I am starting a flow which is belonging to such and such category, okay. So I could explicitly inform or I could infer it by looking at the packets that are going past. Now the voice packets are going to be small packets with large headers, okay. Data packets are going to be large packets with small headers. By looking at that also it is possible to figure it out. Then, uh, which, method, which, uh, which field will make it known? I will make some change in the MAC header. So I will make a change in the MAC header because the access point will process up to the MAC level. I will make a change in the MAC header which will say which is the access uh, category for that particular flow, okay. I mean there are a fair amount of detail, we are not going into all the details here, but it is not hard to understand once you understand the philosophy behind why it is so. What is the difference between access categories AC3 and AC4? Okay, AC3 is actually burst data, AC4 is best effort, okay. So FTP for example, you may just want, now we will meet the same categories later on when we do WiMAX, okay. They also have the same categories but they are called different names, okay. So FTP is basically burst, bursty flow. Even if it is a, let us say, even GPRS has the same access categories. Interestingly, even in GPRS you will find the same four categories, okay. Burst flow means what? I have to do a lot of allocation for a short duration of time correct. So just when the download is happening that particular node will require a lot of resources and then it will release the resources, okay. AC4 means it is just best effort. If there is leftover space then I will carry the data. 
if the request in QAC4 is more than the request in QAC1, even then the priority is decided by the amount of back off that you are going to do, right. So the, the packets in AC4Q are going to back off more than the packets in AC1Q, right. So that is the whole idea behind uh, prioritization, okay. So in fact you can do lots of experiments in this. So uh, many people have asked me this question, so let me answer it in common. What kind of assignments can we give using wireless uh, when we are teaching a course on wireless networks, okay. So the type of assignments that uh, we usually give, so one of them is to do some kind of application programming, okay. You have these J2ME emulators which you can download. You can say that, you know, create a location management application, very straightforward thing. Okay, you download the emulator, you give that kind of an assignment, that is one type. Another type of assignments is to use one of the simulators. You know? So there are three popular uh, network simulators, okay, the free one is called NS2, then you have Qualnet, okay. So Qualnet is, uh, the academic version is free, okay, and then there is called, one called Opnet, okay. Now Opnet is a commercial one, but that is very hard to get. But what you can get is an individual user's academic version, okay. So you may not be able to get one for your entire class, but you can get one, you know, you can ask each student to sign up on the OpNet site and download the individual version, okay. So now some of those things, you can play around with these things. Like for example, the question that you asked, what will happen if I, if the AC4Q is given higher priority over AC1Q? Or what will happen if there is more traffic in the AC4Q as compared to the AC1Q? Such experiments are very easy to do using OpNet or CallNet, okay. So you can give those as assignments. You can say, okay, set this as the traffic, set this as the priorities and generate a graph which shows what is the throughput, what is the delay, okay. So those are good ways of uh, giving assignments, okay. The third type of assignments which we give here are the actual measurement based one. You know, you take an access point, you install an access point somewhere you give a student a laptop and you say, okay, go and measure what is the signal strength that you receive uh, when you are standing away from it, away by two walls, what happens if it is a concrete wall, what happens if it is a wooden wall, what happens if it is a ceiling, floor, all those kind of things. Can? Ethereal, ethereal can be used. So that is all you use. You, know, you run Ethereal and then you are going to see what is the signal strength. In fact, you do not even need Ethereal. Ethereal you need only for uh, trying to see what other traffic is there on the network, okay. Another kind of experiment which you can do is you can carry out ping tests, right. You can say that I am able to see the access point, does not mean that I can communicate with the access point, right. So for example, the access point is transmitting it at 1 watt, the card is transmitting at 100 milliwatts, right. So the card can receive the access point does not mean that the access point can receive everything that the card is transmitting. So even though you are standing at a distance where you can get a decent signal, your voice call may not go through because voice is full duplex, right. You need a two-way connection in order for a voice to go through. So if at that point you stand and you carry out a ping test, you will see that okay, a fair number of packets get dropped, okay, the delays are increasing. So such kind of experiments can be done even with just one access point, maybe one laptop or two laptops in your lab, you can give out such assignments. Is there any mobility management in dot 11? Um, in theory, yes. In practice, no, okay. <clears throat> so in theory, also a f is the one which is the inter-access point protocol. See once there is a protocol between access points, then you can manage the mobility. So dot 11 up to dot 11 B, G, E and all, they do not have mobility management, okay. Dot 11 B is sufficient as far as learning dot 11 is concerned, as far as giving assignments to students is concerned, okay. Some of them will also have patches for dot 11 E. If you have that, then it is great. You do not need any of the others really, okay. Because the difference between B and A is in the physical interface, okay, is in the physical layer. Now I do not know enough to give assignments based on physical layer. So it does not matter to me whether I have A or not in the patch. G, all, G and B again the difference is only in the data rates, but there is no difference in the protocol. So if you have B and E, they are two different versions of the protocol. 
that is good enough. If you want to give an experiment on the power management and routing, it, well, it depends upon the, the thoroughness with which you want to do the experiment. If it is a course assignment type of an experiment, yes it is sufficient. Okay. But if it is like you know it is your own research project, you are doing some PhD in something, then you may have to do a lot of work in order to use NS2 for doing that. <coughs> because when you, it makes a lot of approximations, NS2 has a lot of approximations in terms of who can hear whom. Okay. So depending upon the accuracy with which you want the result, you know what is the aim of the experiment? If the aim of the experiment is to familiarize the student with the technology and you know do something and generate some graphs and get, get some general understanding of it, then it is sufficient. <coughs> if it is to come to some conclusions using the numbers that you get, then it is not sufficient. If there are two wireless networks in the same area, how are the two differentiated? So one way is the channel, right? So 802.11 has 11 channels. So one network will operate in channel 1, another network will operate in channel 6, a third network will operate in channel 11, they will be totally non-overlapping. Out of the 83 megahertz, you are going to use sub parts of the spectrum. 54 Mbps can still remain as the data rate. See, data rate depends upon modulation techniques. It does not depend upon how much of the spectrum you are using. I mean, it does depend upon how much of the spectrum you are using, but main thing is what is the modulation technique that you are using combined with the available spectrum. Where do we configure this? So, if you just look at the access point, so if you are installing an access point, it will give you a configuration screen. Various access points close by will not be under one person. So, you have to uh, have an agreement with the other guy. So that is why what happens is in the airport, it's not that anybody can just set up an access point, right? So the airport manager will tell you that okay, you use this channel, you use that channel, you use the third channel. Okay, so the operators which are setting up access points have to coordinate with each other so that they don't interfere. Okay, that coordination they will do because if they interfere, then both their uh, reputations are going to get tarnished. Okay, so think about this question of how did we arrive at 22 as the number of voice calls okay, or at least work out what are the various additions that have to happen, how much is the overhead in a voice call, we will come back and we will try to answer that question.